Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Dan. If I'd known it was going to be this many people, I'd have worn a nicer shirt. <laughs> <laughs> um, the time I have isn't enough to go into all the things that you get out of a membership with Toastmasters. Whether you're looking for just expanded speaking ability in front of a professional audience, or you're just trying to sit with the cool kids at lunchtime, <laughs> you, you get something out of this club. Just like Ingram, Toastmasters, it's the people that make it the experience. So, I mean, I look forward every week to to uh, Karen's energetic and entertaining speeches about Halloween and, and her home and being a diehard Angels fan. I still remember Olimpo's joke about Chihuahuas and uh, Rottweilers. <laughs> I'll let you guys use your imagination. <laughs> and how can I forget Lori's speech about geocaching? Sorry, Lori, I'm still a muggle. <laughs> I have to tell you, when, when I was in middle school, high school, and even college, I was one of the only people that wasn't afraid to get up in front of a group of people and speak. But then when I got into the professional world, I realized there's just so many great speakers and business people have no time and almost no attention span. So if you want to engage a group of business people, you've really got to be on your A-game. Unfortunately, when I first got to Ingram, uh, just during the first day in my orientation, Stephanie gave, gave a great uh, little pitch about Toastmasters and I saw and took the opportunity to, to join this great club. And I'm in sales and uh, we love to talk about value. Uh, when you give a speech in Toastmasters, you have a person whose only job is to time you, you have a person whose only job is to check your grammar, and another person who's going to give you a detailed evaluation of your speech at the end of the, of the meeting. And if you were to have professional services for all those different things, it'd cost you 50 times as much. So really your question shouldn't be, why should I join Toastmasters, it should be, how do I sign up? Thanks. Colby come up and give a quick introduction about Kirk. Please join me in welcoming Colby. It's been a, quite an honor actually to watch Dan progress through his last five speeches. He's, he's really blossomed and his speeches have become quite wonderful. Although I'm sure he's almost to Kirk's level. But, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I get the honor of introducing our executive speaker, Kirk Robinson. For those of you that work here at Ingram, I'm sure you all know who he is. If not, he is our Vice President of Commercial Markets and Global Accounts of North America. For those of you that don't work at Ingram, that's a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> he speaks at a lot of our major events. VTN is one of them. Hundreds of customers come to that event. He has to get up in front of a crowd of people and sound intelligent, funny, and witty. And that's my introduction for Kirk. We will now have him come over and wow us. <laughs> well, thanks for spending some time. So I'm actually pretty excited about coming in today because I, I hit 20 years at Ingram in March. And when I started here, I would have been in the back row, I would have been behind the glass peering in <laughs> because I would have joined the group that was, I would rather die than speak publicly. Just huge fear, wanted no part of it. And so what I'm going to do today, I'm just going to, I wrote some notes down, tell a little story about myself and how, and, and my evolution into public speaking. And then I'll show you a deck I did at our recent North America kickoff. I won't go through the whole thing, but I'll give an example of a different approach I took that continues to help me hone my skills. And public speaking is such a huge thing. I just was asked to come into the GM program uh, for some of the folks that want to develop into GMs and do a thing on storytelling. And at first I was looking, they're in here for a week, they're in this room. And at first I'm looking at all these different things. One of them was negotiations, and we had Lily, one of our head lawyers, and, and it was emotional intelligence, all these things, and I get storytelling. And I'm like, you know, sock puppets. <laughs> and, but I told the group, you know, storytelling is really key. I started to get excited because you have to be able to tell your story, whether it's in business, personal life. I, you know, when I have to sell my wife on something, I need a story. So it's very relevant. But when I started at Ingram, I was in sales. And as I progressed, I wanted to get into management, but I knew as a manager, you had to run a pep rally. 
And when we had sales on campus, we would do these huge pep rallies. And it was things like donkey basketball. We'd actually bring donkeys in. The executive <laughs> would get on donkeys and play basketball and all sorts of real fun stuff like that. But the managers had to be the MC. And I was just really getting pulled from two directions of, I don't know if I can do that, but I really want to keep moving up. So I did what most people did. I just said, screw it. I'm going to jump in. And I remember doing the first one right out in front of the 1700 building, and my hand was, you know, shaking as I'm talking, and it finally ended, and I'm like, hey, you know what? I'm still here. I'm alive. And, and then a few people were like, hey, good job. And I'm like, R do you really mean that? Because, you know, in my own mind, I did a horrible job. But, but you learn, and you progress. The next step was going into VTN. So I had been doing some pep rallies and getting up in front of my peers and doing some more things. But VTN, for those of you who don't know, it's a community of resellers. So our, our top maybe 400 customers in U.S. and Canada. And that's a big deal because it, it's up to 1,000 people in a room. And you're the main guy. And I kept thinking to myself, can I be that guy that this group wants to follow? and they pay 2500 bucks a year to be in this group. And a couple of my predecessors used to dress up and do funny things, and I'm like, oh, man. I mean, public speaking is one thing, but to get up in a clown suit, and, well, I, don't, I don't know if I even want to go in that direction. So I decided I just had to be me. So I, I did not get dressed up in clown suits, although you will find many a, a picture out there of me in things worse than a clown suit, having fun. But what I learned was when I got up on that stage that first time, my knees were knocking, I was scared out of my mind, but I had practiced enough to get me through that first piece. And if, if I had any advice, if you're going to do public speaking, practice. Practice, 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 because that will give you the comfort level when you're up in front of people to have something to fall back on. So VTN, I only wanted to do it for two years because I wanted to move on out of there, but I had a lot of fun. And, and it's amazing when you do it enough, after I realized, wow, I can get up on this main stage and I can do this, then you start really enjoying it. You're like, let me get back up there. Let me try some different things. So that was another big step for me. The other piece of that I would tell you is having people you can lean on. One of the things I knew was there were people smarter than me about the business, the technology, the needs of the customers. So two people, Jen and I, who's our VP of North American Marketing, and Marie Mioli, they were my foundation. I would meet with them before every VTN and go over my presentation. What key numbers do I need to talk about? What's the messaging? And to this day, I just talked to Marie on the car ride in this morning because I'm presenting at our uh, public sector event in Florida. And I know nothing about the public sector. That's why I hired Mike Kunkey. So I was like, Marie, I got to get up there. I don't want to try and pretend I know it because people will see through that. So she helped me and she's like, well, here's what you do know. Here are the key things. And once again, it's a comfort level. So, you know, I don't have that much pride that I can't go out and tell somebody, hey, I need help on this. Or just have someone review it. Does this look good, right? Know your audience. So that was another big piece. I will, I will talk about uh, failure, too. By the way, I still get nervous, no matter what. So I learned a long time ago, somebody said it's okay to have butterflies, just get them flying in formation. <laughs> so, you know, I learned that it's actually good to be nervous. It gets you it gets you on edge and gets you ready. So I've learned to, to actually use it. From a failure standpoint, I have a couple of, of examples. I went up to a big Cisco meeting with Keith Bradley, who was our North America president, and Alain Monet, who was our COO at the time, and Ken Bass. It was a whole group, and we were presenting to all the big Cisco executives and at the time I was in marketing and running our business intelligence group and I had two slides I was going to be the closer two slides of this great information that I was so passionate about I'm going to just 
show them, you know, we're just a distributor. I know more about your business than you do. So the whole morning I'm, I'm raring to go and I'm listening to everybody. But as everybody else spoke, they were taking stuff from my slides. So Keith Brad was like, well, there's that one study we did, right, Kirk? And, and I'm like, yeah. I'm like, uh-oh. Now, you know, and then Alon gets up and starts talking. So by the time it got to me, I put my slide up and, and I was just like, uh, <laughs> you heard Keith talk about that, you heard Alon, my next slide, I'm like, we really covered all this. And it was just, it was just a bomb. So I learned you really have to be prepared to be on your feet and be ready for anything. You know, I should have had something in my back pocket that wasn't on the slide that I could say, here's some other cool stuff. The other time was one of our North America kickoffs. And it was the same thing. I was in marketing, running BI. We were doing the kickoff, which we usually do in person, by video. And I was going later in the day, and I didn't prepare. I didn't practice. I was just like, I got this. You know, I know this information. And what happened, was by the time it got to me, I had to stand up in front of everybody and I get up there and I'm like, okay, here I go. And, and I didn't have my confidence. And all of a sudden, I'm looking around and sometimes you need that friendly eyes to look out in the audience to help you out. I was getting like the dog look. <laughs> you know, like, what are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> and the room started closing and I had to sit down. And I'm like, oh, oh my God, I'm going to faint right here. This could be it. This could be it. And I just said, hey, I'm a little dizzy. And I sat down and I plowed through it. But I pinned that presentation up on my desk. And I still have it. It's in a drawer. I don't have it pinned up anymore. But I pinned that up there as an example of practice, practice, practice. Because I learned, no matter how good you are and how long you do it, if you're not practicing and you get up there, it's very easy for that to just fall away and then you're sitting there, you're even searching for friendly eyes anywhere, <laughs> nothing. Um, the Dave Human training. So Dave Human uh, does a training for Ingram Micro Execs and it's great. You come in and he tells you, somebody pick the subject and talk 60 seconds on it. And so it's hard to just, not non-stop, you got to just keep going. Then they videotape you, and he talks about how you take a story from the front end and tie it into the back end. So that was another really big help for me, and that was probably six or seven years ago. I just went through a refresher with him earlier this year. It was great because when you're up on stage and you're having to tell that story, you see a lot of people do PowerPoints and they throw a bunch of bullet points up there, right? Then you have, you know, you can read Steve Jobs' book I'm presenting where it's more pictures. There's a lot of ways to go about it, but you want to be entertaining and keep, keep your audience's attention. So that, that training really helped. Uh, BI. One of the things about BI, I took over the BI team and I quickly realized that I was going to be the dumbest guy in the room in every meeting. But I was passionate about what our data could do for Ingram Micro. And the, the team, it used to scare me because every time I'd ask the team, hey, can we do that? This, they were just like, yes, we can do that. No matter what I asked them, they were like, yes, we can build a model and we can do that. I was asked to get up and speak at our North American kickoff. And, you know, once again, I was nervous. I'm getting up there to talk about business intelligence. But what carried me through was a couple of things. The passion. If you're passionate about something, it, it's much easier to get up there and speak about it. And I talked about the amount of data that are go is going into Yahoo and Google and what they're doing and the data that Ingram Micro had and how I believe we could use it in a more powerful way with our, our vendors who really don't understand that end user data that we ship to. So that was another big point for me was realizing, and anybody who's had to get up and do presentations, if you ever have somebody build a deck for you and you have to go up and present on that, it's, it's difficult if you're not the one that built it and, and you're not passionate and you don't have that flow. If you do have that knowledge, I'm horrible at PowerPoint, so most times someone else is building my deck, I just say, here's you know, directionally where I want to go. What I'm going to do now 
is go through a presentation that we did for North America kickoff. And this year we tried to do something different. And Jen and I led the way telling uh, everybody who was going to present, I think there were 18 of us, that we were going to do TED Talks. So how many people are familiar with TED Talks? Okay, good. Uh, 18 minutes on any given topic. I wanted to take a little bit of a, of a risk and do a presentation not just on my business area. I was pretty sure all my peers were going to tie it into their business. And oh, by the way, it was a contest. So for a little added pressure, they were going to run a contest. And I didn't even know what they were going to do, thank God, because I would have been more nervous. They put it, it, in each session, like the morning session, five speakers, they put them up on the board and then everybody voted by texting. Oh. <laughs> so it was brutal. I mean, and the bar would go across and then it would go back and you're like, oh, no. And, you know, we only text That's once terrible. and we're trying to be fair. So I, I wanted to go out and, and do something a little bit different. So I'm going to go through this deck. I'm not going to do the whole thing, but I'm going to give you an example of taking a little bit of a risk. And I, and I talked to a few of my confidants saying, this is either going to go really well or, or really bad. So it's something I'm passionate about. And I, I started out asking everybody, what inspires you? Or, or who inspires you? And for me, somebody that inspires me is my brother, Scott Robinson. And we grew up in Long Island, New York. We shared a room together. And he's four years older than me. And he was never good in school. He barely made it out of high school. And if, if I didn't know better, I think my dad may have uh, greased the, the principal <laughs> yeah. to get him out. But where he excelled was in shop. And everything, it, when, when he got into high school, he moved downstairs in the basement, turned it into a room. Everything in there was handmade by him. Dresser, a little couch, a uh, a coffee table, and he was really into into boats. He had a coffee table, and he's a big surfer, with a porthole in it, and a picture of a surfer. And what my parents didn't know was that when you opened that porthole up, there was actually a cooler. In there. <laughs> <laughs> I won't say what was in there, but he was really talented with this, you know, building things, and, and he loved the water surfing and boats. And this is a picture of him at age 15. He built this boat, little, you know, eight-foot boat three-horsepower engine, and I remember my dad taking us out to the sound and launching the boat, and I was just thinking to myself, you know, please don't let this thing sink, because he was so proud of it, and sure enough, he went out there and tooled around with his little engine, not a drop of water in the boat, right, so big victorious day. So my brother gets out of high school. He's doing handyman stuff, working uh, as a painter and doing some stuff on houses, and he gets an offer to come out to Newport Beach and build condos next to Hogue Hospital. So he gets his van, all his belongings, one of his friends, and he drives out here. But the problem is when he gets to Hogue and there's no condos there that we're going to build them, there's no one there. The job, the money fell through. So he's sitting there up on the hill, and he looks out, and there's a marina. And he says, all right, I like boats. Pretty handy guy. So he goes down there and starts being just a deckhand. And then he goes and takes a class on electrical wiring, so he's more knowledgeable on the boats. He sails around the world. He, he, everybody loves my brother. So he's, he's on all these boats. He's going all over the world, sailing, power boats, everything. And he says, I want to be a captain. So he goes out and gets his captain's license. And I remember laughing at him because he had to take this really tough test. And I'm like, you're not that good at tests. <laughs> he's like, I got this one. Because he was passionate. It was something he wanted. So he's a boat captain for about 20 years, taking big yachts, 60, 70, 80, 90 foot yachts all over the world. And as he's doing it, on every boat he's on, he's writing down what he likes and what he doesn't like about the boat. Noises, hinges, I would do this differently. The whole time dreaming, I'm going to start my own boat company. And so one night, he's up on the flybridge having a beer with the owner of this boat. This guy 
owns oil refineries. He's got quite a lot of money. And my brother's telling him, you know, my dream is to start my own company. And he said, well, how much do you need? He said, I need about a million dollars. I know a boatyard in Taiwan where I've been uh, before where I could build these boats. I just need the money to get the molds. So the guy says, all right, I'm going to lend you the million, but the first boat's mine, and you can pay me back off the first boat. Give me a discount. <coughs> I was like, wow, I'm in. So I'm proud to say today that my brother is the CEO of Paragon Motor Yachts, Aww. building 96-foot yachts over in Taiwan. These things sell for about six to seven million. They're winning awards. He won best in class a couple times in the San Diego uh, yacht show. And it's funny because my brother is so particular about things. And in, you go into the engine room, and the way he built the engine room was with a fair amount of room around the engines because he spent 20 something, 30 years bumping his head, elbows, and mm -hmm. everything else on engines. The other thing he did is he put uh, Bose surround sound in the engine room because he wants it, whoever's down there, he wants them listening to tunes and having a good time. Then he put black lights underneath the engines because they pick up any type of oil. It will reflect and he can easily see if there's any leaks in there. And the, the wood, I mean, you go on one of these boats and I'm depressed going back home. <laughs> they're, they're, they're beautiful. So. What I wanted to do with everybody is talk about, you know, what inspires you. The interesting thing is my brother will go out and, and we'll have beers. He's never worked for anybody other than himself his whole life. I'm at Ingram, you know, <coughs> Fortune 100 company 20 years before that. I was always working for some level of company. So when we have conversations, it's interesting, you know, what, what are the issues he faces and what are the issues I face from two different perspectives. One of the funny ones, he said, yeah, the first day that I hired all these workers in the yard, it was noontime and, and they all grab a sandwich and next thing I know they're all curling up and sleeping on the floor. He's like, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> and he's like, that was just what they do. He goes, and about four days later I was curled up, nuzzled up next to them, you know, just falling in line with the culture. <laughs> so we have really good conversations about business challenges from two different perspectives. So what I did, I wanted to tie it in. Uh, the, the other thing I tied in is my brother's complete lack of fear. He's just, you know, putting his life on the line with the size of these boats and the money. And I'm like, hey, what's your P&L look like? He's like, my what? It's like, I don't know. I have money going to this bank and I got a guy that looks at it. And so just very different. This is a big build. What I did, I won't spend the time here. I just walked through a lot of the areas I'm that I'm responsible for my teams and, and talked about some of the things we're doing. How do we get out of the comfort zone? How do we go take risks? You know, one of the things that we talk a lot about in, in our culture, more so over the last few years than prior, is the ability to fail. You, you have to fail. If you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough. So we don't need failure on a big grand scale. <laughs> but we need failure in pockets so that we can learn what to do and if we're not doing that we're staying way too close to the comfort zone. The other thing I talked about was this book. One of, uh, one of our VTN <laughs> customers, Jane Cage, she's from Joplin, Missouri. She turned me on to this book. It's interesting because Joplin, if you remember, I think it's two years ago, had the tornado that just decimated that city and Jane really <coughs> stepped up and has taken uh, the lead for Joplin rebuilding and has won several awards. But this was an interesting book, How Will You Measure Your Life? Clayton Christensen, he's a Harvard professor. And uh, I just tied that into one of the messages coming out of that is, are you just kicking the can? And that's something that I talked to my team about. Are you just going through life, kind of going down the street kicking the can? Or do you have things you're going to be able to measure it by? When I sit down and talk to my brother, he's got a grand plan to build this boat company to a certain level and sell it, and he's sticking at the high end. He doesn't want to move down and just to move more boats at a lower cost. So we have a lot of conversations about how, how do I challenge myself and my role at Ingram and not just kick the can down the street and say, all right, I'm responsible for SMB, we'll just go sell stuff to SMB. 
and I'm very fortunate with the leadership team I have. Is Jamie Farrell, who runs our SMB sales. I'm pushing him out of his comfort zone, but he's responding. He just created a, a loyalty program. And this is a funny one because Jamie's just getting used to going up on stage. And Jamie has more of a monotone voice. He's an awesome guy, but I'm trying to teach him, you know, get some inflection, get some, you know, excitement to keep the audience's attention. And when we were launching a program once, he's like, Kurt, this, this program's not baked. And I said, Jamie, peek behind the curtain. I'm like, no one out there knows that. <laughs> you know, only you and I know that this is not fully baked. But we're going to go out there like it's baked fully and it's the best damn baked thing they've ever seen. <laughs> so it's fun to work with the different pieces of the business and public speaking. And, you know, I would, I would say to all of you, you know, think about who inspires you, what inspires you. And obviously it's something we always talk about you have to have a kick-ass attitude you know when we go in business it's very easy to get down uh, right now the prior two years my team and I were hitting every number double-digit growth it was just you know everything was coming up roses right now it's the perfect storm you know there's just pockets of business that are down and all those pockets seem to be in my area. So, you know, I tell the team, you can handle it one of two ways. You know, we've been around long enough, this is cyclical. What you have to do is keep your chin up and lead. Make sure that everybody on the team sees us taking the mountain or the hill. You know, not sitting around going, woe is me, business is down. Uh-uh. We'll take the hill every day. And then don't over-celebrate the good times and don't under-celebrate the bad. So. The reason I put this up here is because it, it was a bit of a different experience to do a presentation on a family member. One thing that was really comfortable about it is even though I practiced the presentation, and I actually, I will say, I had it filmed and I sent that clip to Dave Human, the guy who did the training, and he came back and gave me 10 points on what worked, what didn't work, how. I missed an opportunity to tie it together better. So it was funny. The first five points, he's like, great job. Your <coughs> body motion was good. And then the last five were like, team me up. You didn't do this. You forgot that. And, which was great because I'm like, oh, I did. I forgot to really put a bow on it at the end and do a few things. So uh, the I, I just go back to that point that when you're public speaking, it can be in a variety of ways. No matter what you're doing, Practice it. Practice it in front of the mirror. Practice it in front of family members. I've done it in front of my kids, which is really awkward, <laughs> but it prepares you. And when you can do presentations like this, by the way, I came in second place to Lisa Locklear, and Lisa did a fantastic presentation. You know, I, at first I was like, I can't. I lost to our CFO. I lost to the finance person, but she did a great job of tying TED Talks into her presentation. So I put that up there because I'm having fun now. <coughs> Even though I still get nervous and I have to be prepared, I don't mind getting up in front of people because I've learned I just have to be me. You know, I'm just going to get up and I'm going to do my thing and, and not everybody's going to like it. And that's all right because I have enough friends <laughs> and I got family. I'm just up here to have a good time. And I, the last thing I would say is the reason this is so much fun is because I really was the guy sitting in the back row going, please don't look at me, please don't look at me, you know, don't ask me a question. And now I've learned over time and over failures of, you know, it, it's a lot of fun now getting up in front of folks and talking about any given subject. So that's my spiel for today. And uh, I don't know, do we go Q&A or? Uh, yeah, sure. Thank oh you. That, wow. was, that was really interesting. This is really why I did this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? <laughs> this is a big deal right here. <laughs> we got oh, a little Toastmasters toast coffee. Right on. Thank, yeah. you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah. That's very nice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we we'll invite you all to. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I have some questions. So, when you're presenting to a smaller group, you tend to ask more questions yep. in an obviously in format. Some of the questions may not be appropriate, or some of the questions may be a little pointed, or especially if they're business related to the negative. 
how do you kind of take yourself out of that or address that while not just sort of deferring it to later time? Yeah, it, it's interesting. I, I'm going to answer it two ways. Uh, you, you have to be prepared to say no or we'll, we'll take that. If it's not appropriate, I think you just have to you just have to guide the direction and say that's not really directionally where we're going. Or I'd like to talk to you that. That's really more of an offline. Let me catch you offline with that. What else? Control it. We'll take that offline. What else? The other thing is there was a video when I did that uh, storytelling training. There's a video of Bill Gates and Steve Jobs being interviewed. If you've never seen that, go to YouTube and look up Steve Jobs. I see a lot of heads nodding. It's one of the it, it's awesome. These two icons being interviewed. But the question to the two of them was about the, the early software that they used. And so Bill Gates starts out, he's like, well, we had the Commodore machine back then and, and we had, you know, this and that. And he keeps looking at Steve Jobs and there was software and finally Steve Jobs just puts his hand on it and goes, let me tell the story. <laughs> He goes, Steve Wozniak, one of the most brilliant men, was writing code, and we, we got it all the way to the point, but there was no floating point. It was like Microsoft had floating point, and, and we didn't, but he wrote this brilliant software, and it was going to change the way everything w that was done, but, but we kept asking him, uh, you know, do the floating point, and the lady goes, well, whatever happened? Why didn't you get the floating point? He goes, I don't know. One of the great mysteries of the world. I don't know. <laughs> and I just thought it was so cool because it just, what jumped out at me is you don't always have to have the answer. There's a lot, it feels like you have to have the pressure to, to know everything if you're speaking publicly or talking on a subject. I think it's fine to go, I, I have no idea. <laughs> you know, I'll have to look into that for you. But I think the bigger piece is controlling the conversation in a smaller group. And trust me, when we do these little pockets of customers, there's a lot of stuff that comes up that's not appropriate for numerous reasons that you just have to say, hey, we'll take that offline. What we're really trying to do here is get the feedback, so steer it. Kirk, um, you, you mentioned that you um, see Kelp level from the executives, they work with uh, Dave Human as far as or prepping for storytelling, and then you mentioned that you um, got to reach out to confidants every now and then to uh, get feedback on them. Uh, at your level and maybe also on the executive levels, um, how important are the confidants that you have? Do you have mentors that you work with? Uh, that uh, that you, you have a mentor on your level that you reach out and just get very intimate about maybe some of the struggles that you're having uh, you know, with maybe your department or maybe your career on, on, on your path and where you're going? Without a doubt, in fact, you know, Tyler's sitting back there, I sent an article out to the team on do you have five mentors, and it was one internal to work, one external to work, one that's older than you, one that's younger than you, and I forget what the fifth one was, but yeah, for, for me, I'm always looking at who do I think does a great job of public speaking, and does that fit my style, because I'm not going to change that much because it'll get me out of my comfort zone. But from a mentor standpoint, yeah, all the time. I mean, I have folks in outside the company that I meet with that run businesses, uh, that I, I talk to about careers and, and personal life, and uh, I've, I've gotten so much great information on great books to read. I, I mean, I'm married 18 years, so that's I'm always trying to figure out how to keep that on track and going while I'm traveling around because that's, that's another thing. I'll tell this in front of anybody. I'll tell it in front of Alon or anybody else. Ingram's not my number one priority. I have other priorities before Ingram. Ingram's great. I'm here 20 years, so I obviously like it, but it's never been my priority. My, my wife and my kids and family and a couple other things are, are above Ingram, but when I come in here, I'm going to be passionate about it and, and do my best, and the way I do that is through mentors. I uh, learned a long time ago, I'm, I'm only as good as the supporting cast around me and, and the people you reach out to, so. Thank you. Welcome. Kirk, I wanted to ask you about humor. Um, it's an interesting tool when you're presenting to people. What are some of the things that you've been able to capture in your presenting style to inject humor to kind of lighten up maybe a difficult topic? <coughs> yeah, it's, 
if you read any book on public speaking, humor is always one that they say tread lightly, <laughs> you know, and know your audience. <coughs> um, I personally like trying to put humor in where it fits because I think it just livens it up, and makes it a little more real. But you have to look at, you really have to look at who the audience is um, to, to really know is it going to go over well. The other thing is, I will say, you have to know if you're funny or not. <laughs> not whether you think you're funny or not, you have to know whether you're funny or not. Because I've seen some people, and myself included, you try something like, I think, oh, this is going to kill them. And, and you're up there, and all of a sudden it's like, cricket, cricket, <laughs> cricket, cricket uh -oh, you know? So that's a tough one. You, you, you don't want to lead with it. You want to insert it in areas that, uh, that you can. How do you handle criticism in your public speaking or in your professional life if you ever have to visit? I've never been criticized. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think, you know what? Criticism to me, it's like, it's feedback, it's a gift. You'll instantly know whether that criticism is really something that someone's trying to help you get better or telling you somewhere where you missed or if someone's just not happy with your topic or something else. So I'm always looking for feedback. And it's funny because when I was in VTN, I would instantly go to Marie and Jen, and I'm like, did I hit it? And Marie, still to this day, beats me up because I'll be on a press interview saying, I think we can do this, and she'll be texting me. You know, it's like, how many times have you don't think you know this program's going to work? So I think if it's the, the criticism is something that you look at and you recognize, all right, I think that if I improve in that area, I could raise my game. That's good. If it's just you know, criticism because someone doesn't like your topic or your viewpoint, you know, take that gift or don't. <laughs> When you're getting up in front of those larger audiences and you don't really have the opportunity for milk cards, how do you prepare yourself in that sense? Of, I mean, I know practice, 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 but have you ever found yourself? Oh, <laughs> yeah, without a doubt. I, it really is practice, practice. If you don't have the note cards and you're going up and you're doing an hour presentation, mm -hmm. you, you, you better have your ducks in a row. <laughs> now, today's technology is changing. So the cool thing is now when you're up on stage, you've got the big screens in front of you, right? Well, it used to just be you would see a presentation. Well, I could see my prayer. Usually it's up on the screen. I can see that. Now they're, a they're putting your notes. So that's one way that just through modern technology. Now I did a presentation a couple of weeks ago, I forget, maybe SMB Alliance, where I had my notes right there. So you're talking to the audience, you're making contact, and then you can just look down and you instantly have that. But when I was doing VTN, I remember I had, it was a half hour presentation and I was leading with three main points. <coughs> now I was scared out of my mind. You know, once again, it's the first time of the event where I'm walking up on stage. And when you walk up on stage in front of a thousand people, it can be intimidating. You got the lights coming and everything. and so I went up there and I'm going, okay, I'm getting everyone fired up. And number one, and I get through that. Number two, and all of a sudden I panicked and I'm like, oh my God, I don't know number three. <laughs> and I had led with, I have three things to tell you. <laughs> so immediately I'm going, I'm like, oh, I can get humor. I better have something funny coming quick. Because, you know, saying, I forget number three. What was that guy, uh, Rick, whatever his name was, in the presidential race, right? I'm going to cut four programs. He got to three, and then he's like, well, there's one other. <laughs> you know, bye -bye. <laughs> so I think at that point, I didn't have any note cards on the podium. Th and there's tricks of the trade, right? You could go over and you could take a sip and you could look down at your card and go, ah, number three. <laughs> <laughs> I just happened to be extremely lucky and it came to me right as I was thinking I was going to panic and have to divert and go with this and, and just go with two. <laughs> so <laughs> I think either leaving note cards where you can see them, which is rare because you don't want to be walking up to the podium every time. But I think you have to be comfortable. I, I always bring water with me, and I've just built it into where I'll just 
drink water as I as I talk um, because I've had times where I, my mouth dries out and your tongue feel like it's going to stick to the roof of your mouth and you're like uh oh and when that happens a lot of times your nerves and your mind can take over so it's easy for me I, now I don't worry at all I just bring a water with me and take multiple sips but I would say if if anything practice because the the hour long presentations that uh, that can get tedious if you practice them often enough, uh, and I forget what it is like how many times eight times for every half hour, whatever the form. I would just say just practice, practice, practice. The more you put in, the better prepared you are, and the better you look. So just to add to that, one of the things you were reminded of is as you craft the presentation or your speech to make sure that it's front loaded with the things that you're comfortable with, so you can get you know used to the materials and then you can get your legs under you. So you need to start off with build some confidence and then you can go into the more complex stuff. I'll tell one quick funny story. At DTN, we had two of our customers coming on stage because it's always better to have the customers come up and talk because the, the customers in the audience are going to go, oh, all right, these guys walk in my shoes. We're backstage, and one customer <laughs> is joking around and laughing and having fun, and he's just loose as a goose, and the other customer is sitting there looking at his notes and his suit and tie and, you know, just like frozen. And I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> well... We get on stage and I introduce them and the guy who's goofing around, all of a sudden you could just see the lights hit him <laughs> and he just froze. He, wow, this is a big audience. And he's leaning on the podium. He doesn't know where to go or what to do. And the other guy finally looks at me and goes, and he's just a hilarious guy. And he's like, I am so glad I'm doing this with you because you're making me look great. <laughs> and he's like, I got my notes and he's like, here are the three things you need. Bing, 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 bing. And the other guy didn't say a word. Froze up there and wow. backstage, I'm like, what the hell happened to you? You're all jumping around. I'm like, next time when you're backstage, maybe you should think about what you're going to say. So it was funny. Have you ever found yourself talking too fast or not pausing? And how do you reset in the middle of the yeah, I think it, it's one of the things that when you practice, know that what how you practice, if you're timing it, when you're practicing is slower than when you're going to hit main stage. Your, your adrenaline will rush when you're on main stage, and you're going to talk faster than when you're sitting there in the TV room with nobody there. And I think it's just a matter of being self-aware. And it's another thing for me with the water, I build it in so I know all right, I'm going to get through this first slide, and then I'm going to go, how many people How many people here, by raising your hands, think Ingram's a great place to work? Seriously. <laughs> oh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> right, and that gives you the time. Just come up with a question. Uh -huh. Make them raise their hand, and that allows you also to slow yourself and take that deep breath. And yes, I found myself talking way too fast, and, and you do need to just reset. And whether it's the changing of a slide for me, or whether it's a question I throw out, or whether it's just something you make the audience think about, that allows you to just take that. And I know from doing it enough times now that I'm going to get out of the chute fast, and then I know I'm going to start to slow down, and I'm going to get in my groove, and I'm going to be comfortable. Question. All right. Thank you very much, Chris. Yeah, really thank you. Good. All right. So this time we do have the packets over there, and help yourself to cookies and water. And I'd just like to also give a shout out to Colby for organizing this event. Yeah, it was really great. Thank you, Colby. Thank you all for coming. Have a great day. Thank you. And see you next Thursday. Thank you, Kirk.